So as ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much um, for coming here today. Um, it's a real privilege and honor to be standing here in Churchill Hall, the world's biggest sleeping bag, I seem to remember. It's been a while since um, I've been here. In fact, 12 years since I was in here. I certainly never thought I would be standing up on stage um, addressing an audience. So I know some of you have come from far and wide to be here, so um, my appreciation for that. Um, what I'm going to do is talk to you a bit about leadership. Hopefully that's why we're here. We'll talk about leadership. Um, and some of my experiences, um, I won't spin too many army dits, I promise. It's, um, it's really going to be what I've learned since leaving the army, and, but, but also how those skills and experiences I took away from the army have helped me um, in subsequent life um, as a civilian, as a, as a broadcaster, as a, an author, and out on expeditions. Um, and, uh, and there'll be the opportunity at the end to, to ask any questions. If you've got any questions, whether that's about leadership or just about my latest holidays, then please do save until the end. Um, so I took an Uber here last night. I got, a, got an Uber and um, got chatting to the, to the driver, the taxi driver, and um, he was from Egypt. And we got chatting, and he asked me where I was going. I said to the Royal Military Academy, and he said, oh, are you a, are you a soldier? And I said, well, um, I'm, I used to be in the regular army. I'm now a, a reservist um, serving with um, a, a unit. And he said, OK. And, uh, and then he looked at me and said, hang on, what, are you speaking now? I said, I am actually, yeah. He said, oh, sort of, I could see him looking in the mirror. And he sort of squinted and said, hang on, aren't you that bloke off the telly that walks everywhere? I was like, yeah, that's me. He's like, okay, have you been away anywhere recently? So I explained, yeah, I just got back two weeks ago from, um, from a journey around the Middle East. I've just done a circumnavigation of Arabia. I walked across Syria and Iraq and Yemen and a few other places. And um, he sort of squinted at me again, and I thought he was going to come up with something deeply profound. Obviously, he's from the Middle East himself. thought he was going to ask some very important question. And he simply said, why on earth would you want to do that? So it's a very good question. And uh, it sort of begs the question um, a little bit about the question of why. And I think as... As leaders, we, we often, um, we don't like to necessarily explain ourselves, um, but actually I think it's healthy to think about why we do things and, and, and our behavior. I've got a little video that sort of Funnily enough, that's a response I get quite a lot. Um, but leadership, like life, is, is really like a journey with lots of twists and turns. And I think my job as an author and a filmmaker is really to get people to buy into my vision and take them on a journey effectively as a guide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey and how I got to be doing this sort of thing. Um, I think it really goes back to my inspiration as a kid. You know, a lot of us, um, when we think about why we joined the army, probably goes back to, to childhood. Certainly for me, um, my father was in the, in the TA. My grandfather fought um, in Burma in the Second World War, so I grew up on their stories. But if there was one moment where I kind of knew where my, my life was going, it was when I was 10 years old. And I went to a, a talk, not dissimilar to this, by a gentleman called David Shepard. Has anyone heard of David Shepard? Yeah, a few people. For those that haven't, um, he's a, a very acclaimed uh, painter. He sadly passed away last year, but he, he was very famous. He, he's done quite a few mess paintings, did a great one of a Spitfire. Um, but he was probably most well-known for his wildlife, particularly um, African elephants. I remember going to this, this talk, and he was sh showing some of his images. I remember thinking as a 10-year-old kid, wow, you know, this guy is living the dream. He gets to travel all around the world. He gets to go to Africa to see elephants in the wild. And at that age, that, you know, that's, that really appealed. I said to myself, you know, this is what I want to do. When I grow up, I want to be a painter. So I went home, tried to draw an elephant, and failed miserably. It was absolutely crap, I have to say. Um, but undeterred, I thought, I still want to go and see elephants in the wild. So what I'm going to do is go and see my careers advisor. I was a very diligent 10-year-old. And I went to see him and um, said, look, I want to be a professional traveler. I want to be an explorer. And he sort of patted me on the head and said, of course you do, son. Don't, don't we all? Um, why are you going to do a psychometric test? Now, I don't know if you had those when you were at school, psychometric tests. They probably still have them. They still have them when you join the army. But you sort of you fill in these forms. The magic happens. And somehow, you're given your perfect career choice. Well, mine was librarian. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but personally, I wanted something a bit more outdoorsy. Um, but I did as I was told. I followed the advice, and I went to the library and started reading the books that, that happened to interest me. And it just so happened to be the lives of the great explorers. So I started reading the likes of Shackleton and Scott, Richard Burton, Henry Morton Stanley, all these greats of Victorian exploration. And I thought, you know what? If they can do it, then it must be possible. There's got to be a way. So I started reading their autobiographies and, and figured that most of them, the vast majority, 
had been in the army or they'd got some sort of military service. So I thought from quite a young age that this is what I was going to do. And as you can see there, I took it very seriously. Um, but I did. I, I made my plan at quite a young age. And it was actually when I was, I think, 15 years old. I, I'm, I, was, um, I grew up in Staffordshire in Stoke-on-Trent, about 14 miles away from Alton Towers. And my earliest expeditions usually involved me and some mates tabbing 14 miles, climbing over the fence, and getting in for free. So they were my first expeditions. And um, it was on one of these little journeys um, that karma came around and, and, and uh, sort of paid me back when I lost my wallet. I basically, I think I was upside down on the corkscrew roller coaster, and my wallet went flying out of my pocket, gone. I was very upset because it had my pocket money in there. I'd lost three pounds 50, um, but also my young person's bus pass. So it was a terrible blow to my finances at the time. So I was quite relieved when um, a few days later, about three days later, the wallet turned up in the post, um, complete with the three pounds 50 and the young person's bus pass, um, and also a note from the person that found it. And the note just so happened to be addressed from a young second lieutenant in the Royal Artillery. And the note was simple. It said, it's lucky there's people like me out there, um, because otherwise you wouldn't have a wallet. So don't be such a prat next time and keep hold of your possessions. Wise words. So being at the age where I was contemplating a career in the army, I thought I'm going to write back a courtesy thank you letter, but also be a bit cheeky and ask him if he's got any hints or tips on how to get into the army, how to get into Sandhurst. So by return of post, they came back a six-page essay on all the good stuff, everything from how many press-ups I need to do to pass the fitness test. You know, it said, go away and learn to use a, a compass and read a map. It told me you know, which broadsheet newspapers I should be reading. I thought we all know which ones. And, uh, but the one line that really stuck with me was the final, the final sentence. And it simply said in this letter, above all, travel, dot, 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 because you'll have something to talk about in the bar at the end of the night. Wise words, and I don't think he quite realized the impact he had on me at the time. Um, but I did. And so I made a, a decision there and then that that's what I wanted to do. I was, wanted to go and travel. Um, so I decided I was going to go and take a gap year. Now, being from Stoke-on-Trent, not many people had taken a gap year before. So I had to go, go and figure out how it's done. I went and told my dad that's what I wanted to do. I was going to take a gap year. And he said, that's a lovely idea, son. What on earth is a gap year? I explained that it involves going to uh, places like Thailand to find yourself and grow your hair and things like that. And... Um, and I did. He said, well, that sounds like a lovely idea, son. Why don't you get a job? So I had to go and I did everything. I went and put uh, boxes on the conveyor belts at Argos. I stacked shelves in, in Summerfield. I uh, even flipped burgers at McDonald's for a little while. So I did it all and got, got enough money and finally went away at the age of 18, like a lot of other youngsters, and went on my gap year. And I did. I went traveling around South, South Africa. I uh, went to Nepal and um, spent a bit of time trekking in the Himalayas. And I did go to Thailand and found myself as you can see there. Um, but it was a, it was a really eye-opening experience. And um, actually, the words of St. Augustine came to mind. It's like, life is like a book, and those that don't travel only read one page. And I certainly learnt the basics of self-reliance. I learned independence. Um, but the, this was very much a journey as a, as, a young, as a young man, as a kid, out on, out on my own in the world. Um, but finally, I did. I went to university, much to my parents' relief. I studied um, history, where I studied the, the history of overland journeys, funnily enough. So I'm probably one of the few people that's ever studied history and actually got to use it later in life. Um, but I did. I thought, you know what? This is what I wanted to study. This was my passion, my interest. I studied travel writing. And um, so when I graduated, um, I then decided I had to go and go and do my own overland journey. So I decided at the age of 22 that I wanted to go and follow the Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road, um, hitchhiked all the way from London all the way to India over the course of five months. And that involved going through through Europe, through Russia, over the Caucasus Mountains, through Iran, um, through Afghanistan, where I blended in very well, um, over the Khyber Pass into Pakistan, and then finally made it to India. So it was, again, it was, a, it was a great journey. It was basically my second gap year, but it was a, it was a great journey. And again, I learnt, reinforced those lessons that I'd, um, that I'd learnt when I was 18. Um, of course, the, these were individual journeys. I, I travelled on my own, no backup, nothing like that. Um, and so there wasn't really the opportunity to learn any, any leadership skills necessarily. But, but what they did teach me was the basics of, of looking after myself. Um, but then finally, when I did run out of money, I thought I'd better go and actually get that job I'd been talking about. So I did um, finally come to Sandhurst um, and got commissioned into the parachute regiment. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with any, any, army, any army stories. You've got plenty of your own. Um, so I was obviously sent straight back out to Afghanistan. Um, slightly different reception than when I was there the first time, but exactly the same moustache I had when I was 10, as you can see. 
Um, but I will talk about one, one thing that happened when I was in the army. After, after Afghanistan, I was posted to Catrick in North Yorkshire. Now, if you ever want any inspiration to travel, try living in Catrick in North Yorkshire. Have we got anyone from Catrick here today? Anyone who's been posted up there? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I have to say, morale was low. I just got, from, got back from Afghanistan, having had some of the most intense yet exciting times of my life, and there I was teaching 17-year-olds how to shave. Slightly, slightly different um, scenario, but um, I had a very understanding commanding officer. He said, look, tell you what, why don't we raise morale, go away and do some adventurous training. And as we all know, adventurous training is the Army's euphemism from taking you from one cold, wet, windy and miserable place in uniform to doing exactly the same thing in civvies, usually Brecon. But I thought, no, I'm going to do something a bit different. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take some guys and we're going to go trekking in Nepal. I'd been there traveling before as a backpacker. I thought, why not go and organize a proper expedition? We went to climb Mira Peak, which um, some of you might have, might have been there before. It's um, 6,500 meters, so proper mountain. You've got Mount Everest somewhere in the background there. Um, it's one of the highest trekking peaks, non-technical trekking peaks in the world. And a couple of the guys had been mountaineering before, but the other six complete novices. So we set off. It was a three-week expedition. Um, and off we went. This photograph was taken about 250 meters from the summit. Um, we got another 110 meters, and then the cloud came in, and the winds came up, and we had to turn back. After three weeks trekking, we had to turn back. We didn't make the summit. And it was my call, but some of the guys were going to go down with quite severe frost nip. So it was a big decision to make. But nonetheless, it was an incredible expedition. Um, however, as you can see there, nobody's smiling. Um, I then left the, I left the regular army after that. Um, I decided I wanted a, a, change of, a change of career. I felt as though I'd, I'd sort of had my time, albeit quite short, but I wanted to go and do something else. And so I was faced with the question that we're all faced with at some point of what's next. Um, and for me, the kind of the answer came on a plate. I, um, I was having a chat with a, a friend of mine who had just set up a charity out in Malawi, down in southern Africa. And she said, look, we really need some ambulances. Is there any way you can help out? You've just left the army. You've clearly got nothing better to do. Will you, will you volunteer? So I said, yeah, sure. So um, rather than doing the standard sort of buy them on a website, get them shipped out to, to, to the continent and do it that way, I thought, why not buy them on eBay, a couple of grand, paint them white, stick some crosses on the side, and drive them overland. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I got a team um, of friends together. They just so happened to be either former colleagues from the army or still serving. Um, and and w together we drove 10,000 miles through 27 countries all the way from the UK down to southern Africa. Um, and that really was my first experience of taking the principles of that the army teaches you about leadership and teamwork and applying them to the civilian context, albeit with people that, for the most part, had got some military experience. And I knew that we needed a diverse team. We needed people with different skills. So... Um, there was a, a staff sergeant from the Remi that came along who obviously could fix the vehicles. We had a medic, we had a doctor, we had somebody that did all the social media. We, did, we, did lot, we had lots of a really diverse skill set and that really brought a lot to the team. And it was a successful, a very successful expedition. We got the, got the journey done, it took two months and I have to say it was one of the most rewarding and just fun journeys that I'd ever done. And we finally got the ambulances down to um, southern Africa, we delivered them to the hospital and... Everyone was very grateful. Um, and it was actually at that moment that I decided that this is what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I'd, I'd obviously, I'd learnt the skills that the army had given me. I'd got the experience by taking expeditions, both military and civilian. Um, but what I need to do is take it to the next level. More importantly, I was completely skinned at this point and had no money whatsoever. So I thought, I need to make some money. Um, so by applying the skills, I thought, why not actually set this up as a, as a business? So I, me and a, a colleague um, from the army, we set up... Uh, a small company called Secret Compass that basically specialised in taking um, civvies from all, all, all descriptions um, out to interesting places. Read war zones. So we went horse riding in Afghanistan, we went skiing in northeastern Iraq, we took people on camels across the desert in Sudan, um, and it turns out business was booming. So the words of my colour sergeant at Sandhurst as we were slogging across Senny Bridge of civvies pay thousands for this, turns out he was right. So, you know, there is a bit of inspiration. Um, so we did. I set up this company, and, and we did these amazing expeditions. And one of the, one of the expeditions that, um, that really stuck in my mind was, um, was Madagascar. This was back in 2012. Um, what we wanted to do, the idea was to walk 
tab it straight across the, um, the, the island, a pretty big island, um, from, from east to west through some of the most untouched jungle anywhere on the planet. Um, it was about 250 miles. We only had three weeks to do it. Bear in mind, these were civvies with, with actual jobs. So they took, took three weeks' leave, three weeks leave, 13 civvies, and myself as the expedition leader, to try and walk uh, a completely unhacked trail. There was, no, there was no paths, nothing like that. And from the day one to day 20, um, there was going to be no villages. There was no resupply. We had to carry everything. We had a few porters to carry some, some food. But effectively, we were on our own, very isolated. And the idea was to walk this 250 miles through the jungle to the other side. Uh, and we set off, the, the team of 13, after one day, reduced to eight, because I think a few people then realized, actually, this wasn't for them. So they went and sat on the beach for three weeks. The rest of us, we knew that once we'd crossed two days, there was no going back, because there was simply no way to get back. So off we set. And we did it. We almost did it. We got to, we got to day 19. And we knew that we were, we looked on the map, we were a day behind schedule, because one of the guys was, was a bit slow. Um, and we looked at that, we set up our final camp, and we knew that we had to get to um, the beach the next day because people had flights, people had to get home. Um, but we hadn't quite made it. There was still 93 kilometers left to push. Um, I looked on the map, there, was, there seemed to be a trailhead about 20k on. And there was a little, there's some dots on the map. We thought there'd be a village. We thought there would probably be some vehicles or at least a motorbike that we could shuttle people, the, the other whatever kilometers to, to the coast. Um, and actually, I think everyone was quite relieved. You know, all the, all the civvies were like, you know what, we've, we've just done almost three weeks in the jungle. We, we've seen enough. We've seen some lemurs. We're all happy we can go home and pretty much tell everyone that we've almost crossed the island. And to be honest, I was quite relieved myself, frankly. But then there was one person, there was one client, and he was the one that was slowing us down in the first place, um, who said, you know what? No, I want to walk this. I said, he said, I don't care if I miss my flight. I want to walk this. I've signed up to a journey that said that we were going to walk from one side to the other. I want to do it. I want to complete this. And he pointed at me and said, Lev, this was your idea. <laughs> You've got to do it. Um, and he was right. I'd, I'd staked my reputation on this journey. I knew that I had to do it. There was no backing out at this stage. I had to go and actually do it. So I looked at the map, saw those 93 kilometers, and said, OK, well, if we're going to do it, we've still got to do it in the time frame, so let's go. So we had to do 93K in 24 hours. We set off at 1 AM, and we finally reached the beach um, at about uh, quarter to 11 the following night through some of the most tough terrain I've ever encountered. And it was one of the physically the hardest things that I've ever done, for sure. Um, but you know what? Even he did it. They, we did it. There was three of us that finally did it. The other guys did get the, uh, the, the transport. Um, but it was a lesson for me. It was a lesson that actually, you know, reputation precedes everything. Um, and whether you're, you know, on a civvy expedition providing a service, you know, I was new to setting up a business, trying to establish my brand in, in this very competitive space, or whether you're a, a leader in the army, you know, if, if you're going to do something, follow it through and stick to your guns. And there he is slowing everyone down at the beginning. Um, but what is being a leader? What is, what is leadership about? Any, any definitions? What is leadership? You're all leaders, aren't you, here? I mean, basically, in short shrift, it's, it's simply getting somebody to do what you want them to do, right? In, 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 in short terms, that's what it is all about. But there's different types of leadership, isn't there? We've, we, we've all been taught about the, the various types of leadership. Um, transformational, transactional, but if you look at it on the sort of the sliding scale of you've got the dictatorial leadership, you've got Assad here, and then you've got the inspirational, transformational leadership, you've got the Dalai Lama here. So you've got the, the left and right of arc. Um, I think we all know who we'd probably prefer to be out of, out of that, but we talk about transformational leadership, this, this art of creating a vision and getting people to buy into that vision, of engaging with it. Um, and as a leader, you're not only there to tell people what to do, you're there to inspire them to want to do it for themselves. Um, so imagine you know, you're a guide. You, know, you have this great opportunity as a guide, not just as a leader, but somebody who can take people on a journey and make it fun. And it's not just a case of making it fun for the sake of making it fun. It's because if you can take people on a journey that they want to be on, you'll get the best out of them. You'll unlock their potential and you'll bring the very best out of them. They will perform more effectively because they want to be there. And I think that's something to remember as a leader. Um, does anyone recognize some of these people? Can anyone name all of them? Anyone name four of them? We must have, we must have somebody that can name one of them. 
Okay, we've got, we've got a few people. These, these are some people that inspired me. We've got, we've got Churchill, we've got Wilfred Thesiger, we've got T. Lawrence, we've got Freya Stark, we've got Richard Burton. These are all explorers themselves. They all just so happen to lead teams across the desert, which is, which is kind of my, my personal forte. Um, but they, they all had a vision, very different visions, but they all had their own visions. Um, Inspiration comes in many different forms. You know, we've all had those uninspirational leaders, haven't we? And I'm sure we can all remember a few people that we simply didn't trust to get us across the finish line, or people that just had that slightly too long screwdriver that was meddling with how we did things. So just remember how those people didn't inspire you uh, and how you can learn from those lessons. Because I think the difference between somebody who, can, who you do trust and who you do actually think is okay to some, a really great leader. I think the difference there is all about vision. It's all about having a vision. And that really leads on, I think, um, to the most important thing, which is setting an example, isn't it? And it comes back to the, the, the Army's leadership code, which I'm sure you've, you've all um, looked into, um, vision being the first one. And the other ones are what? The next one is support. It's supporting, making sure that, as a leader, you're providing your team with the tools that they need to fulfill that job. And that comes, again, back to mission command, doesn't it? It's, it's not having that long screwdriver. It's enabling and empowering people to do the job that they're supposed to do and trusting in your team. And then final, finally, it's challenge. It's making sure that you know, those under your command, those in your teams, are sufficiently challenged that they will actually put their back into it and not just rest on their laurels. Because I think until you're actually challenging people, you're not giving, giving them the opportunity to prove themselves. And I think that is a really important thing to do with a team. Um, back to the Dalai Lama. So I was in, on my Himalayan journey. This was 2015. Tabbing across the Himalayas all the way from Afghanistan to the Tibetan border. And I got to India. And I, I thought, I can't come to the Himalayas without um, at least trying to meet um, the most holy man of the mountains himself, the, the Dalai Lama. So um, for a few weeks before I arrived in Dharamsala, which is where the Tibetans live, the, uh, we'd been ringing up his private office. And um, the response was always the same. Basically that the Dalai Lama is a very busy man, um, and quite frankly, you're not Michael Palin. Fair enough, I thought. Um, but we were persistent. We kept ringing him up. And um, I rang him up and said... Uh, you look, you know, if he is around, is there any chance we can do an interview? And um, he said, look, give us your dates. We told him some dates that we were hopefully going to be in Dharamsala. And he said, look, I'm really sorry, but the Dalai Lama actually, when you're expecting to be there, is actually ironically going to be in England. He's going to Glastonbury Festival. So um, at this point, we'd sort of pretty much given up. And, and when we did get to Dharamsala, we, we bumped into a young Tibetan monk. And we explained our predicaments. I was with my cameraman, Ash. And so we were really sad because the Dalai Lama isn't in town. He said, no, actually, he, he just landed back this morning because we were delayed by a few days anyway. Um, perhaps he didn't like the music at Glastonbury and came back early. But we, um, we said, OK, well, is there any chance of meeting him? He said, look, look, go and, go and knock on his door. So we did. We went down to his compound and knocked on the Dalai Lama's door. And we met the private secretary again, the guy that we've been badgering for weeks. And he said, not you two again. Um, he said, OK, well, tell you what, since you've been so persistent, why don't you come back tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., and the Dalai Lama was having a private ceremony for a few, a few friends. Come along and you might get to see him. So we turned up as directed, 7 o'clock in the morning, slightly disappointed to find about 450 Tibetan monks all queuing up to meet their spiritual leader, but we'll let them off given the fact they'd walked 500 miles over the mountains to be there. Um, and, um, and the queue was going pretty slowly. We thought there's absolutely no way he's going to have time to, to even say hello, let alone you know, speak to him. So Ash, being a diligent cameraman, got his camera out and started taking photos, um, even though we've been told not to. And um, lo and behold, before we knew it, a big hand came out of the crowd, grabbed us both by the scruff of the neck, and we, were gonna, we thought we'd get thrown out for taking photos. Um, but it turns out, actually, the Tibetans are very good with PR. And uh, they dragged us off, and they plonked us down in the Dalai Lama's living room. And we were told that we would get a face-to-face, one-to-one, half-an-hour audience with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, and of course, this was a great opportunity, but it's times like that when you get a bit of a mind blank. Um, you know, what is the one question, given the opportunity, that you're supposed to ask the man who, according to the Buddhist tradition, is the living incarnation of God? It's a tough question. The best we could come up with was, have you ever worn trousers? <laughs> but this is a man who inspires. You know, his position wasn't a choice. He was chosen at the age of two to be the Dalai Lama. 
Um, so he, wasn't, he, he didn't choose to be a leader, but his style of leadership, you know, his, it was very much his choice. Um, and he, I think he really is the embodiment of somebody who uses transformational leadership to inspire people to lead a certain lifestyle. And I think by setting an example and taking people on a journey of self-discovery, which is ultimately what he does, he gets the best out of people. And leadership isn't about titles or authority or dictatorship. And I think that's the thing to remember. If your people fear you, you're doing something wrong. So the Army Leadership Code, coming back onto that, the, um, what's, the, what's the mnemonic, what's, the, uh, what's the, the thing? Leaders, isn't it? Anyone tell me what they are? I'm sure you all can, you just don't want to. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay, leaders. Um, you've got lead by example. We've talked a lot about that. Apply reward and discipline. Demand high performance. Encourage confidence in your team. Recognize individual strengths and weaknesses and strive for team goals. Now, when I was on my Nile expedition, I came across lots of very remote tribes, uh, no more so than in South Sudan. Has anyone been to South Sudan? I know the army's out there at the moment doing, doing certain things. Um, South Sudan at the moment is, is in the midst of a civil war. Um, I was there in 2014, a couple of weeks after the civil war began. Um, I have to say, it's a bit like the Wild West of Africa. You know, there's, there is literally two tribes at war, um, and, and what's going on there is, 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 is pretty brutal in, in many places. There aren't many places that are removed from the conflict, but there is a certain tribe called the Mundari tribe, who are quite a peaceful people. Um, they live a very basic lifestyle, but they've got their cows, which are the main form of currency, and to keep the cows safe, what they do is they often take them to the River Nile, they swim them across the river onto these floating islands of papyrus. Um, and that's where they live. They live in reed huts, and, um, and they stay away from the conflict by going there. I wanted to visit these people. So I got out to, to this island, um, and you know, being a, quite a tribal society, they, sort of, they, they won't really let you into that society until you've proven yourself. So I had to undertake a particular ceremony to sort of get them on side and to basically impress them. Um, and I had to really use all the facets of, of, the, um, of the Army Leadership Code to do this. <laughs> Not my finest hour, I have to say. Um, so there is, there's me in my living room. There's the, the cliche of the explorer at work. It's not really my living room, I wish it was. Um, but I think that's the cliche, isn't it? That's the sort of spinning the globe, looking at a map, drinking a whiskey, plotting the next expedition. Um, turns out there's a bit more to it than that. Um, in the world of exploration, there's a saying, there is no problem so bad that you cannot make it worse. Have a little think about that one. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's all about making sure that if you, if you undertake to do something this daft, then you've really got to make sure you're best prepared to follow through. It's all about preparation. And, and planning. And ultimately, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into an expedition. The, the Nile journey, the first sort of televised one that I did, um, took about two years of planning and preparation, getting the finance, getting the funding, getting all the backing in place, the visas, the paperwork, all the bureaucracy that goes with it. Also, the more practical considerations. You know, what do you do if a lion is chasing after you through the bush? What do you do if a gorilla is beating his chest a meter away from you? What do you do if you get bitten by a snake? All of these things. Also, you know, what kit do you need to pack? You know, what, what's the most important things? Uh, one of the lessons I learned from my African journeys um, is the importance of always carrying a pack of cigarettes. Now, I'm not a smoker. I don't condone smoking. Um, but it turns out that most gunmen in Africa are. And trust me, when you've got an AK-47 in the back of your head um, and, you know, there's nothing quite breaks the ice like offering somebody a fag. And it saved my life now on three occasions. So there you go, kids. One for the, uh, one for the books. Um, but I think preparation, training is key in any facet, you know, leadership in particular. You know, we, can all, we can all learn to be leaders. We can train to be leaders, and we can all become better leaders in our jobs. So I think that is something that we, we can do. Um, and we talk about values-based leadership a lot. You know, the Army's values and standards are drilled into us from day one. Um, and I think values-based leadership really is, is where it's at. It's making sure that you take those values and standards and you apply them in every facet. So I'm going to talk through some of... The, the values and how leadership can, can apply. Um, the first one, what's the first one? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the, ac well, not the acronym, the numeric, the C drills, isn't it? Yeah, C drills. What's the first one stand for? Courage. 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 Perhaps the most important one. Um, courage for me, 
Um, one example was when I was in the, in the Himalayas again, um, I got to Nepal, and ironically for a walking expedition, I had to take a taxi. So I was, I'd reached this small village called Rukum in central Nepal, and it was about five o'clock in the, in the afternoon. It was already going dark. There was nowhere to stay. There was, a, there was a Maoist uprising at the time. There was lots of protests. The local villagers said, look, we're really sorry, but there's no guest houses here. There's nowhere to camp. You need to go to the town, which is five miles away. Um, so I broke my cardinal rule. I had to get into a car, but the plan was I was going to come back the next day and continue walking from where I'd left off. So I got into a taxi. There was myself, my guide, Binod, and also my brother, who came out, who'd basically come out for a holiday. He, he, this was day two of the holiday. And, um, and off we went. We drove up over the mountains. It was pitch black by now. And just as we reached the crest of the mountain, I heard this enormous crunch. And I knew exactly what had happened. The brakes had failed. So the car went careering down the road. And there was a really sharp right-hand turn. The car did not take the right-hand turn. The car went flying off the cliff. Um, and it was a 450-foot drop. Um, the car rolled, bang, 10 times um, until it finally came to a stop. Um, I'd been thrown clear of the car along with Binod, although I don't really remember that bit. Um, and I felt my arm had been severed. You know that bit on Saving Private Ryan where he's on the beach, he picked up his arm wandering around slightly confused. Um, I kind of felt like that's what happened. I couldn't feel it. Um, the reason I couldn't feel it actually wasn't that it had been severed, but actually it was just snapped and pointing the wrong way. And so a rather painful experience. Um, I, I, hadn't, I wasn't unconscious, but I did realize, I was sort of looking around, I saw Binod, I could hear him groaning, and then I re remembered that my brother was there. Um, I shouted for him, his name's Pete, and I saw that the car was basically on this very precarious, it was almost comedic, because the car was on the edge of a cl another cliff over, look, over a river, and the car was sort of balancing like this, and my brother was still in the car. He climbed to the back, he got out of the back window, which was completely smashed through, and luckily, he wasn't as injured as, as we were. But his courage that day was, was quite remarkable. I was in no fit state to be doing anything because I, I, sort of, um, I could barely stand up. Um, I, I was in so much pain that I was just lying there. Um, and Pete somehow managed to muster the courage, um, not only to coordinate the rescue, but he knew that in order to go and find some villagers, I mean, the nearest village was a mile away, he had to go and find a torch. He had to climb back into the car to go and get a torch, even though it was dangling off this cliff. And some, and some meds as well, and some morphine, um, which he then had to administer before he could then go and find help. But this was a, a guy, you know, my brother, he'd never been traveling before, he'd never been on an expedition, he'd got no training whatsoever, but over the course of three days, he coordinated the entire rescue, including speaking to a helicopter, he sorted everything out while he was high as a kite on morphine, he squared it all away. And, and the courage that he showed was quite remarkable. And the other person um, was Binod. So after we finally did get rescued after three days, um, we had to then get flown back. My, I had to go and get an operation in the UK because at this stage my, my sort of bones had all wended the wrong way. So they said this was just after the earthquake in Nepal, so the hospitals were all pretty messed up anyway. So they said, you've got to go back to the UK to have an operation. Um, it then took 40 days to, to fix before I could then fly back out to continue with the journey. Binod had um, hurt his back quite badly. Um, but I think more importantly, his wife was definitely saying, do not go back on that expedition. Um, and yeah, I don't think I was in her, in her good books at this stage. Um, but I said to Binod, look, I'll totally understand if you don't want to continue this journey with me. I've got to finish this. This is, this is, this is my vision. I've got to do it. Um, but I'll understand if you, if you want to back out at this stage. But he said, you know what? No, I've started this and I want to finish it. And he did. So we went back and we carried on walking from the scene of the crash and you can see there, the car was pretty mangled. Um, but the courage that both Pete and Binod showed on, on, in that whole episode was something that was inspirational for me. Um, D, what's the D? What's, what's D stand for? Discipline. Um, why, is, why is discipline important? We've got, we've got the Army Sergeant Major here. Why is discipline important? I've always wanted to do that because he was my colour sergeant here. <laughs> <laughs> it is keeping people in check, exactly that. You know, it is, it's basically, it's the glue that, that, that keeps everything together. It underpins all of the other facets. And I think discipline is, is incredibly important. You know, I didn't have to shave today. I'm very much in my, um, in my guise as a civilian today. But I thought, you know what, I'm coming to Sandhurst. I better do before somebody tells me off. So discipline is, is crucial. Um, and also, 
sticking to your guns. There's a little video here that has got some very tenuous links, but I just quite like it. Yeah, sticking to your guns, very important. Um, next one then is, of course, respect for others. Uh, I think it's important. I, I learn sort of, I guess, with my job of going to meeting other different cultures and so on, um, but also within your team. It's respecting people's opinions. Um, I think it's really important as a leader, and certainly the way I like to exercise leadership um, on the ground as a, a, in these civvy expeditions is you've got to be inclusive. You've got to get people's opinions. And even if I know what course of action I want to take, or even if I know the course of action I'd like to take, I still open it up to the floor because you just never know. Somebody might come up with that brainwave, that little spark that you'd not even thought of. So I think it is important to include people and, and get their buy-in. Uh, and I think you can, by asking questions, you can, you can really do that. Um, one example of when this went slightly wrong was um, I was in the Himalayas again with Ash. This is my, my cameraman. Um, and we'd somehow become separated from our horses. We had some horses and we had a local guide. They knew the way. Um, but for whatever reason, we'd sort of lost them. And they had all our bags. They had all our equipment. They had our food. Um, there was just us in, you know, shirt and trousers. That was it. And, um, and off we went, and, and Ash and I it was getting on with the day, and we were getting slightly concerned that we hadn't met up at the RV with the, with the horses. Um, and then the path disappeared. At the top of this glacier here, that's Ash. The path disappeared. And we had two choices. One was to continue at the same height, contouring around to try and get to this little settlement that we'd planned on, which is a few miles ahead. Um, or the other option was to take the shortcut straight down into the valley, um, we knew there was probably going to be a river down there somewhere, but up the other side. It was a lot shorter, um, but it, there was more unknowns. Um, I was up for staying at the same height and, and taking the detour, but hopefully a safer route. Ash wanted to, uh, to go straight down the valley and get the shortcut. We were both tired. And for the first time, I've known Ash for a very long time, since, since uni, um, we've all, we argued. And when I say argued, there were, there were, there were some pretty harsh words said, and um, we, we weren't going to come to any, uh, any agreement. And I, and I thought, you know what? What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> so there are times, I think, when actually what was the bigger picture here? You know, Ash was, he was my mate, uh, but he was also a cameraman. He was on a job, and he was at the point of completely having enough and saying, look. And I, and I thought, you know, if I put my foot down here and say we're going this way, you know, it was my, my expedition, my, my vision, I could have my way, but the chances are the next day he would have just been on the next flight home. And not only would I lose a cameraman, which is a fairly essential component in a, making a documentary, but also a good friend. So I, I thought, you know what, the bigger picture here, I'd let, let, let him have his way. It might go wrong, but what do we lose? We just, we get a little bit lost. So we did. And, and not only did I say, you know, okay, fine, you can have it your way. I think you've got to accept responsibility as a leader. So I said, you know what, Ash, you're right. Let's go down that way. And so we did. We went down into the valley, it took about an hour to get to the bottom. And as expected, there was a massive raging river with absolutely no way to get across. Um, it was already dark at this stage. We were both completely knackered. So we ended up having to sleep rough in the pouring rain. It was minus one. It was freezing cold. We had no warm kit. Um, and it was one of those miserable nights of my entire life. Um, but I think actually by doing that, it kept the team intact. Um, and we, we made it out. Obviously, it was, there was a couple of moments where it was a bit sketchy and you know, probably ended up was a, as close to a survival situation as I've ever wanted to come. Um, but ultimately, you know, the team remained intact. Morale stayed high because we were joking about it the next day. Um, and actually, ultimately, the expedition continued. So there are times when you simply have to sort of swallow your pride, swallow your ego as a leader, and, and just think about the bigger picture. But talking about respect for others, here's a little video how some cultures are slightly different, um, and you've got to respect the way they do things. Obviously, at the time, I had no idea what they were talking about. But um, the next one, then, is, is what? What's the I stand for? Integrity. integrity. Exactly. And what does integrity mean? Integrity is doing the right thing, not the easy thing, isn't it? It's making sure that you, you do what the right thing is. Um, on, on my expeditions, I always make sure that I've got a local guide, somebody who um, knows the local areas. They don't necessarily need to know the route, because I've got Google Maps for that. But they need to understand the culture. They need to understand the languages. And on my Nile journey for the first half, I had this guy called Boston. He was a Congolese refugee living in Uganda. Um, he spoke seven languages. 
He knew East Africa like the back of his hand. This was a man very much in his comfort zone. And even though I'd been to East Africa quite a few times, I was going through areas that I'd never traveled through. I was going through languages, areas that I didn't speak. So it was important. I was definitely out of my comfort zone. Um, but I thought I need to get to know this guy before we set off. So I actually invited him to London. Talk about a man out of his comfort zone. He'd never been to Europe before. Um, and you know his eyes were on stalks. He, he, was, he was enjoying it, but also slightly, slightly wary. And there was one particular day where I was busy doing something, and Boston said to me, look, I'm a guide, I'm a leader, I can look after myself, don't worry about me. So I gave him his tube map, I gave him his oyster card, and the last I saw of him on that particular day was him going the wrong way down the escalators at Charing Cross Tube, shouting, I'm going into the bowels of hell, <laughs> which is pretty accurate, if you ask me. Um, but Boston, you know, he, he, was a, he was a man of integrity. And um, there, was one, there was one instance in, in Tanzania. We were, we were in this area of rainforest. Um, I'd slightly underestimated um, how long it was going to take us to get through this jungle because um, we'd, we'd stocked up for a couple of days of food, but we thought there's a few villages, we'll be fine. Anyway, we ran out of food completely for three days. Um, we were pretty hungry at this stage. Boston was, was very hungry. And he said to me, Lev, can we go hunting? And that would have been the easy option, uh, but I had to explain to him, I had to use my own integrity and explain that actually I was trying to raise money for a conservation charity, so it wouldn't go down that well. Um, but he said, what about, um, what about a pigeon? Can I get a pigeon? I was like, yeah, go on, a pigeon, that's fine. So he kind of fashioned this catapult out of a bit of wood and um, a bicycle in a tube, rubber, and, and off he went. Two hours later, came back with a sparrow this big. And uh, we roasted it and ate it, and quite frankly, it didn't fill much of a hole. Um, so I was very relieved the next day when we finally did reach um, a little village and there was a little old lady with a cauldron. Um, it's like something out of the films. And it smelled really nice, so we got up there and um, you know, I was so hungry, I really didn't care what was in it. But um, I, I asked her, I said, well, what is it? And she, she said it's called um, Alicor Viand. Anyone speak French? No, neither do I. That was a really bad pronunciation. But it means meat beans, Alicor Viand. Meat beans. And basically, um, I really didn't care, so I wolfed down an entire sort of gallon of this stew. Boston was rolling around, laughing his head off at this stage. And I said, What's wrong? He said, Well, do you know what you just ate? And I said, Well, it's meat beans. I mean, there's no meat in it, it was just beans and rice. Um, at which point he said, No, 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 that wasn't rice, they were maggots. So, uh, yeah, they let the beans go rotten, so there's more protein in the stew, apparently. But food was a perennial problem. Has anyone who's been to Belize, anyone been on exercise to Belize? Yeah, you might recognize this guy then. Aaron Diaz. The next one then is, of course, loyalty. Okay, loyalty is something you know it is really important, particularly in the army, but in all facets of leadership. Um, I went to South Sudan, going back to South Sudan, this was back in 2014. Um, I was going against the grain of lots of refugees wanting to leave the country. Um, I got past Juba and I was heading north to a town called Bor, which was right on the fracture line between the Dinka and the Nua tribes. And, um, and this was the scene of, of some pretty heavy fighting. The morning that I arrived, there had been a massacre inside the UN compound. 65 people had been killed inside the actual compound. The, the town had been set alight. This place was completely messed up. Um, and on the way to, um, on the way to, from Juba to Bor, there was myself, um, my mate Will, who's a doctor in Boston, and we had an extra bag because we knew that getting food, as I've mentioned, was, was quite tricky. Um, so we had to carry a, a, an extra bag, um, which, is, which is difficult when you're walking, when you've already got a big rucksack. So we employed a local porter. He wasn't a local, he was from Uganda, but he'd been in Juba looking for work. And there's this 19-year-old kid called um, Siraj, and he was desperate for work. And so he said, well, come along. And he showed a lot of courage by coming on that journey because he knew that there was a war going on. Um, he was very inexperienced, um, but he was the only person willing to come with us, so we didn't really have a choice in the matter anyway. Um, but as we were getting closer and closer to Bor, and the, the stories that were coming out of this place were, were so horrific, um, but he said to me, look, no, I'm, I'm coming, I need the money, but also I quite enjoy coming along on this little adventure. So I thought, okay, you can come with us. And he did, he, he showed incredible loyalty. And when we got to... When we got to Bor, there was only one place to stay, the South Sudan Hotel, which had already been burnt down, um, but there was about three rooms that weren't completely ramshackle. And so we, we checked into this hotel, and we were told by the proprietor, look, whatever you do, do not leave the hotel. Um, we're expecting an attack tonight. So we thought, 
brilliant, just what we need. Um, and, and he was right. Nine o'clock, we heard gunfire. So we thought, well, we can't go outside because we just don't know who is who out on the streets. It's not like there's people, you know, there's pe all people wearing all sorts of uniforms. We thought the only place to go is on the roof and we can watch the fireworks from a good vantage point and at least get some good footage out of this. So we did. We climbed up onto the roof and the rebels were advancing. Um, they pretty much encircled the whole town. We were watching the gunfire go over. The tracer was kicking off. You know, this was, this was the real deal. And, and we were sort of watching this whole display. Siraj, the U Ugandan porter, was bricking himself the whole time. Um, but he stuck with it. You know, there was nothing, nothing, there was no effort for him to go, but, you know, he, he put on a brave face. And the gunfire was getting closer. Then there was artillery. There was mortars coming in. Um, quite terrifying stuff, especially for a 19-year-old you know, who had never seen that sort of thing before. So um, it was that, that night we thought, okay, we, we need to get out of here. The UN had all been evacuated, um, but we'd had a contact, and I was in SATCOMs with this guy who was the flights coordinator for the UN, and we managed to get him on. He said, look, we can get a helicopter to come and rescue you, um, but there's only two seats. There's only two seats on the helicopter. Um, and Siraj, so very brave of him, he said, you know what? You, do, you guys go, get yourself out of here. At least I can blend in. You know, I'll be able to find a way to get, to get back to Juba. Um, and I had to make a decision at this stage. It would have been easy for me to take the helicopter out, but um, he demonstrated incredible loyalty to me, and I had to show it back. It was really important. So I said, no, we're not going to take the helicopter. We're going to wait till tomorrow, and we're going to drive the seven hours back to Juba to escape that way. Um, and I think it was important to demonstrate that, because ultimately, again, it comes back to your reputation. If you get a reputation for jacking on people, it will come back to bite you. So it's a really important thing. And there's, there's Siraj there, wondering what on earth he was doing. And the final one then, what's the S? Selfless commitment. Um, and I'm going to talk about somebody else here who, nothing to do with my expeditions actually, this man. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather, age 19. In, um, and he was posted to Burma in 1943 um, and 44. And he was with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. He was attached to the Chindits. And... He, for me, was one of my earliest inspirations. I mentioned it right at the start. But talking about selfless commitment, um, part of his job, he went on a recce um, in the jungle. He went on a four-man team, a four-man patrol. They went off to go and find the Japanese. And they did find the Japanese. They got ambushed by them. The Japanese opened fire, and they killed his three mates, all of them. He was on his own at this stage, out in the middle of the jungle. And what did he do? Well, he had to do a runner, of course. So... Off he went, and he found himself confronted with a swamp. He had to wade through the swamp, at which point he lost both of his boots, his trousers came off, and he was simply left with his rifle and his underpants. And he had to wade across this swamp, chased after the whole time by the Japanese. And what did he do? Well, his options were try and head back to the patrol base, which was about three miles away. But he knew that if he did that, he would have led the Japanese right back to all of his other mates. So he didn't. For three days, he walked in the opposite direction to try and lead the Japanese off the trail and not lead them back to his patrol base. And then he went, went firm, and only when he knew that he'd completely shaken them off did he go back. And he, he even went back by a completely different route to make sure that nobody was following him. But by doing that, by showing that selfless equipment, he managed to save the Japanese from knowing where the rest of the team were. So I think that really does demonstrate an incredible level of sacrifice and selfless commitment, which has stayed with me for a very long time. So going back to those values then, we've talked about all of them, but I think the one thing that really comes through in all of them is a sense of courage, and, and that hopefully has been shown there. But there's also a difference between courage and mindless stupidity, and I think this video here demonstrates a bit of both. Um, so, yeah, leadership then, I'm going to finish up now. Um, leadership is a journey for you and those people um, that you lead. And you've got the choice to direct how that experience is. Um, I like this, this photograph here, not just because it's a picture of me with a flag, um, but it's what it represents and what it doesn't show because there's one bloke with a flag having just completed a journey. This was at the end of my Nile journey after nine months walking, 4,200 and something miles. I was pretty relieved to be there. What you don't see, of course, is the people behind the camera, the people that 
support you on your journey, the, the cameramen, the fixers, the local guides, all these people, the people back home that support you. Um, and it's important to remember that in order to achieve great things, you need to surround yourself by great people. And you as leaders can make your teams great because that is your privilege. What you also don't see going on behind the camera is the several very bewildered um, Egyptian holidaymakers trying to get a suntan whilst this daft English bloke was running into the sea with a flag chased after, I hasten to add, by the local lifeguard who was blowing his whistle saying I was outside of the safe swimming area. It's slightly ironic. Um, but I'm going to leave you now um, with a little video of my latest journey around the Middle East um, just to give you a taste of what I've been up to and then we'll do questions after that. Thank you very much. Cheers.